So I'm going to give the first part of this presentation, and then, and then David's going to, going to finish it. Um, some logistical announcements. Um, a reminder that, that tomorrow is the last day of access to Ad Health. Um, but of course, you know, the data are available to researchers, so you can apply for the data on, ad, uh, on, on uh, dbGaP um, and continue using it um, under your own uh, IRB and, um, uh, and data. Uh, security forms. Um, there will be breakfast here tomorrow, um, but the bus leaves at 8.30, 8.45, uh, to go back to LAX. Um, you're going to be receiving instructions from the Russell Sage Foundation uh, probably next week mm -hmm. about uh, reimbursement. Um, you're also going to get a, a feedback form from them, so please you know, give, give um, feedback. Um, it's helpful to them to know whether they should continue to hold these summer institutes, and it's helpful to us to know if, you know, as they continue, what, you know, how we can improve things uh, further. Um, and of course, let other people know about the uh, the summer institute. Um, and we were, you know, if uh, we'll probably hold it again in two years, and we're looking for um, more great applicants. Um, and okay, and then tonight we're meeting at seven o'clock in the lobby uh, to head to the activity. All right, so let's um, uh, just review some of the key ideas that have come up uh, over the last two weeks, and then we'll talk about um, what the landscape, what we think the landscape is going to look like going forward. So um, one important idea was the, that what is a genetic effect and. Uh, the idea of this hypothetical experiment of changing the genotype at conception and understanding that, um, that all of the things that, that, that happen as a result of that change in the genotype are part of the genetic effect that are being captured in twin studies or that are being captured in GWAS uh, when, you, um, when you identify um, a, a genetic effect. Um, the additive genetic effect um, is uh, when, when we take the linear projection, so we're getting the average effect over, uh, averaged over any kind of dominance effects or G by G effects or G by E effects. Um, and so you should think of it as an average treatment effect. Yeah? We were talking about this at lunch, and it feels like sometimes, like I understand the natural experiment where you change the gene, and that seems really like, like the right way to think about it. Yep. But I think sometimes calling things that are moderated or, or mediated by the environment um, genetic effects, like, makes people sort of uncomfortable. Um, and it's sort of like, it's not like an actual content problem, it's like a PR problem. Like, how would you feel about calling the genetic effect like the sociogenetic effect, or, or like the non-environmental effect? You, do you know what I mean? Like, like Well, it's not the non-environmental effect, because some of it, because it could very well be mediated by the environment. Just a, you know, the not exclusively environmental <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it's a tricky thing to come up with, with terminology. I, I think that the, the you know, maybe you're right that we, we need a better word for it. But this is the, I mean, I think, um, you know, this is the language that's used in the literature. And so I think our point is that we need to understand conceptually what it is when we're talking about, you know, having found a, a, a SNP association or, or, you know, when we're talking about the um, heritability estimates, which are supposed to be describing the, you know, the, the, Variance explained by genetic factors. You know, that that actually, you know, what do we mean by the var you know, the, yeah. the effects of these genetic factors? Um, okay, so the genetic, as we just talked about, the genetic effects can operate through the environment, um, and so we need to think about these kinds of uh, understand that these endogenous environmental uh, reactions to changes in genotype are part of the genetic effect. They're not, you know, some kind of separate uh, gene environment correlation. Uh, which would be a, a separate addition to, um, to explaining the phenotypic variance. So closely related, related is um, that heritability is about the sum of these genetic effects, and so the same um, lessons apply to understanding heritability. In fact, that's um, precisely the Jenks critique, that um, people often, even researchers in the field, often talk about heritability as if it's a purely biological uh, telling you something about the biological factors on the trait, but that's not right. Um, it's telling you about the genetic effects that include the endogenous environmental factors. Um, and um, a distinct, although related point, is that 
um, just because something, some, a trait has a high heritability doesn't mean that you can't intervene um, and, and have a big effect on the, on the trait. So the, the example, the pedagogical example is eyeglasses, fixing the uh, eyesight, which has high heritability. But there's real examples like height that are very highly heritable traits, and there, but there have been big changes in, in average height over the last uh, couple of centuries that are largely due to, or almost entirely, due to um, uh, improvements in nutrition. Um, so another point about heritability um, is that we really need to be careful in, in how we interpret the estimates. They're not, um, they can't really distinguish. If you just have data on twins, you can't distinguish between the additive genetic variants and other parts of the genetic variants. So what you're getting is some kind of mix, and you need to keep that in mind when you're interpreting uh, twin study estimates, that they, they're interpreted, you know, they're probably, you know, if you want to interpret them as the average, uh, as the narrow heritability, then they're, they're going to be overestimating that uh, often. Um, and, and heritability um, is, is useful to us as we move to molecular genetic data as an upper bound uh, on the, pow the predictive power that we'll be able to get out of polygenic scores. Okay, so then um, environmental effects, are kind of in, in analogous to genetic effects, we want to think of those also as the result of a hypothetical experiment, a treatment effect from modifying the environment and looking then at the downstream outcomes. Um, and when we, when, as we move to doing gene-environment interaction studies, um, having a plausibly exogenous uh, environmental factor that we're using um, is pretty important because otherwise it, it can be uh, difficult to disentangle uh, what looks like a gene environment interaction effect from what might really be a gene gene interaction effect if the environment is correlated with with a, a genotype or what could be um, um, a uh, um, could be a, a gene gene environmental effect if the environment is correlated with parental genotype, um, sorry, with, uh, yeah, well, it's, uh, um, yeah, so that's another example of, of how it could be a gene-gene, uh, um, a, a really a gene-gene effect. Okay. Um, so the additive genetic component is the best linear predictor um, of the phenotype. Um, we can, there are a couple of ways we've talked about for estimating it. One is Gremmel, which uh, Matt Keller talked about. Another uh, approach is LD score regression um, that um, uh, Raymond talked about. And those are both ways of using molecular genetic data to estimate uh, the additive genetic component, at least as measured by the, the SNPs that you have uh, in, in the data. Um, we talked about three big problems of estimating um, genetic effects, and these are big problems even beyond that. They're, they apply more generally to empirical work. One is the, the problem of confounding, which in the, in the case of genetic effects uh, it, it, it is largely about population stratification. Um, they, a, an approach that, that used to be common for trying to deal with stratification was controlling for self-reported race, but the evidence that we've seen so far suggests that that's, that's not going to be sufficient. You really need to do more than that. Uh, principal components um, um, seem to be doing pretty well, but even there we want to push on that. Uh, you know, we're not sure that for very small effects they're going to be sufficient. So um, you, know, you always want to think hard about this and think about um, you know, whether we're getting uh, close enough to the ideal experiment of the within family uh, effect, which um, is not confounded by population stratification. Second big problem we talked about is multiple hypothesis testing. Um, that comes about because there's many variants you could test, many different ways you could cut the data. Um, um, if you wanted to explore gene gene effects, then you get an explosion of possible um, hypotheses that you could consider. Um, gene environment interactions uh, similarly increases the number of uh, potential hypotheses. There's lots of different ways you could code the variables and specify the regressions. Um, and so all of this 
uh, uh, creates potential multiple hypothesis testing challenges that we're going to have to deal with by um, uh, adopting more stringent significance thresholds, like um, through a Bonferroni correction, um, and or pre-registering our analysis plans to tie our hands about what we're going to, uh, wh which hypotheses we're going to test. Um, and finally, low power, um, which um, in the context of, of finding individual um, SNPs uh, comes ultimately from what we call the fourth law of behavior genetics, the fact that for most of these complex phenotypes that we're interested in, um, individual variants are going to each have very small um, effects. Um, and the problem with low power is that uh, it's not just that you're unlikely to find an association if it's really there, but also if you do find an association, if it's statistically significant, but you had low power, it doesn't tell you that there is an effect. So it really that means that the results are uninformative no matter how they turn out, um, which, um, uh, and um, if you find an effect and you have low power, then the effect sizes are likely to be exaggerated. That's, um, uh, that's uh, related to the winner's curse. Um, and so, um, you know, so I think it's, uh, it's really, only worth doing uh, a research project if you know going into it, or if you, if you have reason to believe going into it, that it's going to have um, adequate statistical power. Um, so we've talked about uh, power calculations in kind of simple cases, and you worked out a power calculation on the first, uh, on the first problem set and created a tool for yourself. Um, in more, you know, there's lots of tricks for doing power calculations um, that are worth learning that we haven't talked about. In particular context, when you're thinking about um, your own research, it's worth you know, investigating um, how you do power calculations for, for the particular kind of study design um, that, that you're facing. Um, and in the worst case scenario, if you can't find some existing calculator or tool or formula or way to do the power calculation, you can always simulate data that's um, like your study design to, to get a sense of whether, you know, what kind of uh, level of power you, you're going to have with your sample size. Okay, so, um, so um, we've seen a big change in social science genomics in the last few years. Uh, I think it's largely driven by the dramatic decline in the cost of genotyping, which means that there's now a lot more data available um, than there has been before. That's made it possible to do large-scale GWAS that have led to an explosion in the number of uh, loci that have been identified with um, medical and other kinds of, um, of traits. Um, it's meant that we can now build polygenic scores that are predictive of a, of a large set of traits, a growing set of traits. Um, and um, as we've been talking about now for, for the two weeks, we're starting to see applications uh, um, using genomic data in the social sciences. Um, so just you know, to list some of the many kinds of applications um, that are possible. It's G by E, polygenic scores as, as control variables or to, as for use for randomization tests, um, estimating heritability or, or genetic correlation from non-twin and family samples, uh, directly using uh, the genetic evidence, Mendelian randomization studies. Um, we haven't talked about um, structural modeling using genetic data, but that's, that's another, um, I think, very promising uh, kind of application. Um, you can directly study uh, assorted of mating, for example, looking at the genetic relatedness of, um, of uh, uh, partners. Um, I think Dalton Conley has some, has some work uh, along those lines. Um, mapping migrations, um, uh, and more generally using uh, tools like the principal components as measures of ancestry, as uh, Omer was just talking about. Um, and, and understanding evolutionary history more broadly, as in uh, Jonathan's presentation, as in um, what Remy, uh, the work Remy was, was proposing. Um, as, you know, I think another change that's happened in the last couple of years, besides the uh, dramatic increase in the availability of data um, is 
um, is a change in research practices. So five years ago, um, I think it would have been fair to say that a lot of the results in social science genetics um, hadn't been, uh, uh, been reproducing very robustly. I mean, it's not, you know, we can argue over which specific results might, have been, might be true or not true, but the problem is there was, there was a lot of debate and it's just hard to know which, which results you can trust and which you can't. And, that, and it just wasn't leading to cumulative knowledge that, that uh, a lot of us were comfortable enough uh, building research on top of. Um, so what we've seen in this area, and I think it mirrors um, what's, hap what's happening in many other areas of science as well, um, is rising standards, uh, recognizing that um, you know, what are realistic effect sizes uh, in uh, this kind of work, um, incorporating those into power calculations that are done ex ante, um, you know, not based on the estimated effects in sample, but based on other information we have and uh, making sure we're doing well-powered research, being aware about multiple hypothesis testing and publication bias and interpreting um, the results that we're uh, reading, um, assessing the credibility of findings, um, and uh, and then often pre-registering analysis plans to improve um, uh, the credibility of, of what's being reported. Um, we talked at the very beginning, the first, the first evening, uh, about, about ethics. And I think it's important to remind ourselves uh, of some of those issues because they're very, very important in this area. Um, we have a, um, there's a, a, a very negative history of mixing social science and genetics. And we really have a trust problem, you know, in the broader um, community of, uh, you know, uh, of the world, <laughs> basically. We need to rebuild uh, trust and show that we can do this kind of research in a responsible way. Um, so one kind of ethical issue is, um, is, is how is protecting respondent privacy. Um, with genetic data, there's a, there's a greater risk of re-identifying people because you just have so much information about the person from their genome. Um, and we want to balance that against data sharing and data availability. So we want to find ways of being open and transparent with our data, but without uh, risking um, uh, uh, putting people's privacy at risk. Um, another issue that comes up um, often in, uh, in, in our work is making sure that, um, that the consent is appropriate for the research we want to use the data on. I mean, we've, um, uh, you know, a lot of individuals consent to some, you know, there was the example that Michelle gave about the, um, the Native American group that thought they were consenting to one kind of research and then actually their mental health uh, uh, was, ended up getting studied. Um, in our context, um, the, the potential issue is, you know, we, we go to medical genetics uh, cohorts and the individuals may have consented to participate in medical studies and if we're going to study their educational attainment, we need to make sure that that is contained within the, um, you know, what the, the research subjects consented to. So that's always something we, um, you know, we need to, you know, we always ask the uh, cohorts who, who collaborate with us, you know, double check your IRB and make sure that that this is consistent with, um, with what your um, research participants agreed to. Um, I think um, something that's going to, ap that applies to all of us as we do work in this area is to make sure that we accurately communicate what our results mean. Um, I think it, it, it benefits the, us as a community if we emphasize the limitations of the research and, um, and, and certainly avoid um, hyping the results. Um, okay. So, um, so where is this research going to go in the next few years? Well, I think we're going to see, um, you know, growing availability of, of data sets. Robbie's going to send you um, a, a, a list of data, so I won't go through these in detail. Um, one thing I'll point out is that um, we maintain on the SSGAC website a list of the cohorts that are participating in any studies that, that we've done, um, which you know, we, we've tried to, we try to include basically all of the studies with genetic data that have 
um, measures of the traits we're interested in, so it's likely to include um, any of the kinds of outcomes, behavioral outcomes that you might be interested in. So that's a good resource. You can look at that list and see if there are data sets you might not have been aware of that could potentially uh, be relevant for you. Yeah, so I'm going to come back to the Estonian. That's a great point. I'm going to come back to the Estonian bank um, soon. When is the genetic data going to be available? Next week. Okay. <laughs> so, 50,000 people next week. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think it's also safe to predict that uh, with the growing, you know, growing sample sizes, we're going to see even further explosion in the number of SNPs that are identified. Um, better understanding of the biological and behavioral mechanisms underlying the associations, more applications of and, and development of new methods. Um, uh, you know, I, I think something we're going to see, which is a change from um, the status quo right now, is that with large biobanks like the Estonian Biobank and the UK Biobank, where you can get access to individual level data, we're going to start seeing development and use of more powerful methods that use the individual level data, whereas to date it's really, there's been a lot of emphasis on developing methods that are, uh, work with summary statistics. Um, this is the um, projections that Patrick showed you in his talk. Um, this is the project projection of how predictive polygenic scores will be at different levels of heritability as a function of sample size. Um, as a reminder, we're now, we're in this uh, range of sample size, which is where we see the steepest increases in the predictive power of polygenic scores. And so as these kinds of studies get done with more phenotypes and, and with the existing phenotypes and larger samples, you know, there's going to be um, a lot of highly predictive polygenic scores within just a couple of years from now. Um, I think that um, until now, the main constraint on our ability to learn more about the genetics of behavioral traits has been lack of available genetic data. But um, that's changing. The genetic data are now becoming widely available. And I think the constraint is, is becoming instead the lack of availability of phenotypic data in the large genotype samples that, that are available. Um, so um, you know, this, uh, this is an area where I think we as social scientists have a role to play because medical geneticists um, who are largely the ones um, designing these studies and deciding which phenotypes to include wouldn't think of the kinds of behavioral phenotypes that, um, that we're excited about. Um, so, um, so one thing that, um, that some of us have been uh, developing uh, is a, a tool for collecting um, data on behavioral phenotypes using a, um, a smartphone app. Um, so the one we've developed uh, uh, is called Ask Me, um, which collects data on a whole bunch of uh, behavioral traits. Um, so this is a, an example of, of what it looks like when you're using it. It has some, um, some tasks. This is reading the mind and the eyes test, uh, which I know Varun is very uh, familiar with. Um, so you're asked to um, say what, what emotion is, is, is shown by the person's um, eyes, and you, it's basically the way the app works is it's, a, it's like it's texting you and you're kind of responding to text messages and saying, you know, which sort of questions you want to ask next. This is an example of a Raven's matrices uh, test of um, cognitive abilities. What's the answer to the I one? There's no answer. No. Uh, well, oh, these are the four possibilities. Panic. Jealous, panicked, arrogant, and hateful. Yeah. Is it? This is an autism <laughs> test. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. If you're interested in, in, in testing your, uh, your own ability to uh, recognize it, what's the, what's the, this is called a test of, what, what is it? We call it a test of cognitive empathy. 
cognitive empathy. Okay, so if you want to know how, how cognitively empathic you are, track down Varun. Yeah. Okay, so this is a, so this is a list of, of just all of the things that we've currently incorporated into the Ask Me app. So this is, in parentheses, is the number of questions. We have one question on educational attainment, one on risk taking, one on happiness. You know, so there's a bunch of, a bunch of different um, uh, measures here. Um, you know, we're very interested in feedback and, and improving this, and, and so you know, I encourage you to take a look at this list and the slides that you have access to, and let us know if we're missing things that you're excited about. Yeah. What's darkness? Uh, <laughs> darkness. Uh, it's a good question. I, I, so I don't, I don't know. I, I think it's, I bet it's some kind of uh, personality type scale, but I don't know. Yeah, so I'm going to okay, so so what we're doing right now is piloting it in the Estonian biobank. Um, so Tonu has been um, has been uh, facilitating that. We've sent it so far to almost 500 uh, participants in the biobank. Um, there's uh, fewer than 10% have taken it up and downloaded it. Um, so one of the things we're exploring now is how to increase uh, take up. What we found is that among the people who download it, they're, they're very active users. They, 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 answer, they go through tons and tons of these questions. Um, and that's consistent with what we've heard from, from others, too, who have developed similar kinds of um, uh, um, survey tools. Yeah? Do we, do, we, do we have genotypic data of everyone we send it to? Yes. So we can actually, like, genotype yeah. that yeah. you us take up. That's right. So that's a potential, <laughs> potential phenotype. Yeah. 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 And I think the one problem, maybe, <laughs> is why this take up so slow, because you know, the summer has you know, hit the road, so uh, <laughs> we probably have to <coughs> retry again in August. When, when know, they're the boarding calls. Rains <laughs> arrive. But you know, there was hail today in Estonia, so maybe they also poured them, uh, maybe they just you know, downloaded it. <laughs> yeah. Like you can do a lot of cool things with this, right? I mean, perhaps we can talk later, but it seems like all these apps can even if you don't have genotype, they can actually see where you are, where you're moving, etc. And you could just put it on whatever uh, Apple Store uh, and just like create a global data set of all these things, right? Absolutely, yeah. So there's a lot of more. Lot, I, I totally agree. Yeah. So let, let let's anyone who has ideas for things we should be measuring, let's let's talk later. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So I guess um, so. This as a people who, who you have genotypes for, but then can you link like a phone number to the person's genotype to see how consistent they are or just having certain measures? Um, well, I mean, in the data that we're going to get access to, we're not going to have the phone numbers linked because that would be identifiable information. But we will know things like, you know, how often they they um, open the app and how how many games they went through and or questions they answered, that kind of thing. But you wouldn't know, for example, if this is a person's gene, like if it, this is person one's genotype and this is person one's answers to text Like can you link the individual oh. bio? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's the yeah. point. Yeah, we're going to link the genetic data to the, to, oh, okay. to, to the answers to the survey question. Exactly. I wasn't yeah. really sure about that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So Burn. in the case of, you know, the student bio, like it's not just uh, questionnaire data, it's like all health data, mm -hmm. behavior data, you know, medication use, you know, whatever, everything. Yeah, so yeah, this is on top of everything else that the Estonian Biobank already has. Yep. Yeah, Varun. Well, there's a question that I have been asked, and I'm sure you would also have been asked as <laughs> um, a selection bias with such an approach, you know, especially like if you're looking at some of the more sort of psychiatry conditions like in the autism or depressive symptoms. If you have this approach, you can imagine that people who are more higher on the depressive symptom scales are perhaps less likely to participate. Um, I mean, do you have any way to sort of address things like that? I mean, I think it's a good question. And, you know, I, I think, you know, one should always be worried about potential selection biases. And whether it's going to be a problem, I think, depends a lot on, on the phenotype that you're studying. I mean, certainly if you're interested in, in health outcomes and, like, you know, the, um, you know, the effects of smoking or something, you should worry about whether there's, you know, some people have died and are not in your sample and that then, but and not observing them means you might be underestimating the health effects of smoking because you're not seeing the negative effects it had on the people who aren't there. Um, I think for the, uh, w you know, for the kinds of traits 
that we're looking at, my impression is that, that these effects are often um, less, uh, these problems are often less severe. And I mean, one way of assessing that is looking at things like the, you know, how well the polygenic score, which is largely, const which is constructed from these, mostly from these convenience samples, um, which have lots of selection biases, but then we can construct a polygenic score and predict in the HRS, which is a representative sample, and the prediction seems to be pretty good. Um, so that suggests that, you know, it's that, that's not what's driving, um, you know, most of the genetic signal that we're, that we're finding. But, I mean, it's always something to, to keep in mind, absolutely. Yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah, I love that idea. Yeah. I'm just remembering because like 10 years ago, there was a website that would essentially ask questions like this or like little math problems, and then it would donate rice to like like foreign countries. <laughs> Free like, rice buckets. People, I mean, I was like in high school, but people would just like would go crazy for it. And like you would play it like, you know, for hours. But something, I mean, that would obviously like make some weird selection of your sample of like empathetic people from <laughs> all sorts of people. Um, but that would be like, you know, I guess. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a good, I, that's a, I like that idea. We have been thinking about possible incentives, and you know, for now, we're, we want to explore how far we can get without, you know, without incentives. But yeah, for sure. Yeah. So is this only used for stolen data, or is it going to be used for the data So currently, it's we're piloting in Estonia, so we can we can learn, you know, we can improve it, learn how you know how to maximize uh, um, uptake, but. Um, uh, we're going, the plan is once we finished, you know, once, once we finished exploring in the Estonian Biobank and, and rolled it out to the full Estonian Biobank, then we want to kind of pitch it to the UK Biobank and other, other large um, um, already genotyped data sets. So this, if you want to play around with it and, you know, give, give us suggestions, uh, we have the, this is the, uh, URL for where you can download it. It's it's Android only right now, um, um, so that's that's the reason is that Android is is the most widely used kind of phone in Estonia, um, but uh, um, you know we're, we'll probably make uh, other versions um, in the not too distant future. Okay, so let me turn things over to to David, who's going to talk about. Um, you know, what kind of research to be doing and what the job market looks like. Okay, so, so Dan started by reviewing some, some theoretical concepts. I'll, I'll start by sort of reviewing some of the key themes that we've been trying, key points that we've been trying to repress upon you um, throughout this course. Um, okay, so first one is dedicated to Patrick. <laughs> um, is the analysis well powered? That's all, always a um, question you should ask yourself if you're planning a study, considering a study, or evaluating the credibility of, of somebody else's research findings. A second one is what about multiple hypotheses testing without a kind of full disclosure of the um, of the um, uh, the 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 the, uh, the hypotheses that were tested in a particular study is really really hard to interpret the resulting p-values that are that are being reported, and so to help your readers um, deal with that, you want to you want to be transparent about it. Um, okay, a third point is stratification. There, one of the main themes um, 
has been that um, so far in GWAS, PCs solve a lot of the problems that we were seeing in candidate gene studies because they allow you, first of all, to restrict your original estimation sample to one that's very ethnically hom homogeneous, and secondly, because they just allow you to control much more finely for even more subtle um, types of stratification um, bias um, than you would if you were just using these more coarse uh, you know, uh, racial self-classifications um, that were sort of commonly used to control for stratification in candidate gene studies. We now know that um, uh, you know, very often that, that, just, that just isn't enough. We've also, been, we've also talked about the possibility that going forward standard approaches in GWAS may become less um, effective in due time and that's something to, to keep in mind as the samples become larger. A fourth question is how much winner's curse is there um, in, 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 in the estimates that are being reported. Um, winner's curse um, calculations come up all over the place, um, including um, in settings where you have some finding and that, you're and that you're interested in replicating in order to calculate what sort of sample size you would need for the replication analyses. Um, it's, really, it's really important to, to have a plausible estimate of the effect size that you're trying to detect. Okay, we, talk, we also talked about G by E. We think that in the years ahead, there are going to be more and more opportunities to, do, to look at, uh, to, you know, to do serious G by E re research as the polygenic scores become more predictive, in some cases also with you know, single, single genetic variants. Um, and we talked about the important, we talked conceptually about what we mean by G by E, and we talked about the importance of, of trying to isolate some variation in the environment that comes from something that sort of approximates um, uh, an, uh, an experiment. And we saw some examples of that, among them was Patrick's um, uh, work in, on, on Rosla in the UK Biobank. Um, and finally, we talked about things like, you know, if you see an application of, of, um, um, of you know, genes as instruments analysis, you want to think through carefully the, the sort of assumptions under which the analysis makes sense and actually uh, you know, estimates a parameter that has a causal interpretation. Now, let me say that for all of these things, um, we've often emphasized the kind, kind of ideal uh, scenario that you'd want to find yourself in. For example, when we talked about population stratification, um, in practice, you always have to make compromises. So the message we're trying to convey is not um, is, is, is not that you should try to make the, you know, the perfect the enemy of the good, because then no papers will get written. All, all papers have this problem. The message is just that we often think it's, con it's, it's useful when you're approaching a research question to start by asking, OK, what's the ideal experiment that I would run? And then you go out and you try to approximate that experiment. In doing so, you have to compromise in all kinds of ways. Um, and then you can think, think about the likely consequences of the various ways in which you have to you know, compromise with the, with the ideal, be upfront about it, and try to say something about you know, the magnitude of any biases that this introduces. OK, so we've talked a lot about PGSs, and, and I think largely for good reasons. But I do want to just convey um, yeah, you know, but 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 I, I also want to make sure um, that our that you know that it's not some you know we don't think it's some universal truth that you should always um, use PGSs. It really depends on the on the settings. For the most part, for a lot of the phenotypes we've discussed, PGSs make sense because um, because 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 of what we've been calling the fourth law, namely that most single genetic variants are going to have really small effects. Um, um, but there are, there are, there are trade-offs, as usual. One of, them, one, of the, one, of the, one of the potential disadvantages with using a PGS is that you're going to aggregate you know, these dips, SNPs with very different you know, biological annotations that may operate through very different mechanisms. So it may limit you in your ability to pin down specific mechanisms. Um, and so you know, whether or not it's useful really depends on the settings. In settings where all you care about is predictive power, it's usually going to be a very good idea, right? Um, but it's also, uh, you know, I, we also want to make the point that there are settings in which you know, it makes a lot of sense to study specific variants, especially if you're interested in, in biological uh, mechanisms. Um, we didn't have a lecture on this specifically this year, but there are going to be settings in which um, single SNPs or maybe a collection of SNPs that were selected on the basis of you know, sharing some, some you know, b b b on the basis of some prior information we have about their function could be sort of incorporated into into empirical work, into structural models to give you um, and give you some um, better ability to sort of measure the par parameters of such models that otherwise usually have to be sort of inferred very indirectly and under very strong assumptions. Um, 
In settings where you're interested in genes using genes as instrument, it may be that you think you can make a plausible argument that some variants are more likely to satisfy exclusion than others, and in such settings it might make sense to, to restrict your analysis to those. Um, in, in, um, there are settings in which you, you, you may actually be well powered to detect G by E um, effects with single, with single SNPs, and I will give an example um, just now. One of them is you know, Mr. Big and smoking. Mr. Big alone has an effect size that's, um, uh, you know, that's actually large enough to study in, even in samples of something like 10,000 people. Um, BMI and FTO is another one. FTO, of course, being one of the first BMI-associated genes, common variants to be found, Huntington's disease, etc. cetera. Um, so, so one point, yeah, and, and you know, ironically, these, 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 two, these two SNPs were both uh, discovered by GWAS, uh, and so, and so but, but those GWAS discoveries actually create a lot of opportunities for people interested in more social scientific questions um, because we can use them to, to, to do, to do, to do follow-up work in different samples. Okay, but the general rule here we think is that for single SNP analyses um, to be informative, you probably want to you you probably want to restrict yourself to the ones with large and robustly established effects that are biologically um, uh, well characterized. Okay, now something about data collection. Should you be collecting your own data? Well, we've seen how the costs of genotyping keep falling, um, so. To a first, to a first approximation, the answer might be yes. <laughs> it's usually a good idea if you're running a study anyway and collecting survey data from somebody, and if you have a freezer somewhere where you can store the samples, even if you don't have the uh, resources to do the genotyping now, uh, we'll probably soon be in a world where, the, where it will be very, you know, very low cost. And in my own experience, um, um, even in the design, you know, in, in the design of any um, research that involves new data collection, it's usually impossible to completely foresee how the data will ultimately end up being used. I mean, you obviously collect it with some purpose in mind, but very often with these genetic data sets, it turns out that they have uses in other settings. Somebody publishes a paper and wants to use your data for replication or follow-up analyses, and so um, there is, um, you know, by, by, by gathering these data, you're giving yourself the, uh, the, op the opportunity and the option of, of, uh, of doing the genotyping in the future, yeah. So Right. This kind of stuff, but realistically, let's say I run a survey and I collect uh, saliva samples, because mm -hmm. that's probably what I'll do instead of using blood samples. Um, how realistic is it to put stuff in, in my freezer and... We have a man here who knows a thing or two about storage. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, storage, the, the saliva, this is nothing, it just means one, like, you know, just like minus 20, sensitive the material like the degrading material is to handle <coughs> so like so you're describing I put this in my freezer and I let it go for 20 years I'm probably not going to live in the same place for 20 years so I'm going to transport it presumably in a bag between freezers oh, I'm ju just very practically like how how big of a constraint is the sensitivity of the handling for um, you know if you you know Store the you know the saliva in the because the, it's, it's just it's single stabilizer so all the enzymes in the in saliva are actually uh, you know they're not functional anymore when it's you know stored so if you until you keep it you keep it frozen between like moving slabs and then you can use just like dry ice uh, and just leave it stay frozen but you can also just you know extract the DNA and then you know when it's nicely sealed it can do like so extract the DNA, but not, uh, not, not genotyping. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so um, um, 
as usual, like my experience is that invariably you know, doing your own data collection t turns out to be a lot more time consuming than you anticipated when you started. And, and so of course you always want to ask yourself, you know, the answer to this question obviously depends on what you're trying to do. Um, and as Dan already mentioned, as we've seen repeatedly throughout this course, more and more sort of data sets are mushrooming up and becoming available um, for, for researchers. And there's every reason to think that's only going to accelerate in the future. So you should al always ask yourself, you know, given my question, does it make sense to gather my own data? Or could I address it convincingly in one of the available samples? Um, and um, um, in some settings, in some settings, it may be, it may be, uh, it may be, uh, you know, some of the, some of the point we've been making about low power may not apply. For example, um, if you have a small sample, it's perfectly fine in most cases if, if what you're interested in is you know, estimating somebody's ancestry or using polygenic scores. Um, it's just that gene discovery, single SNP discovery is usually not going to work in, in, in small samples, at least not for the sort of outcomes we're interested in. And here's just some calculations based on the, roughly the predictive power of the polygenic score from EA2. Um, and EA1, and what it shows is that even in the sample of a few hundred people, you're well, you're well powered to detect the EA2 score in say more than 300 people, provided you have a sample of European ancestry um, individuals. We still face this problem that in, 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 other, um, in, in, in members of other ancestry groups, the predictive power is lower. So if you want to, you can alternatively think of this, this uh, row as giving you roughly the sort of sample size you would need to detect a main effect of an EA2 score in a sample of non-Europeans. Question. Question to you is, uh, in the case that we have really unique samples, like let's say Native American, one group of Native Americans, and we know EA2 or 3 are going to drop by half or more. Mm -hmm. And um, have you ever seen published or heard of people using the data they have, even if it's under a a few hundred subjects, to then run a simulation to test it Yeah, I've not seen any analysis like that. I mean, I know that people at the, people at the Broad, one of them, Patrick's colleague, uh, what's her name, Alicia Martin, has worked on related questions, and, but, 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 but um, I haven't seen any simulation evidence on, of the sort you're asking about. On the other hand, it's not my area of expertise, so it might exist. Yeah. So you guys are all involved in you know, social science and education Yes. Also, Dan just showed you, I mean, we actually have done some of our own data collection via surveys in Sweden and other places. Dan just showed you the Estonian efforts that are underway. I mean, we think that going forward, um, so, so far, we've been purposefully following a strategy of just analyzing what's available. Um, and that necessarily meant we had to work with these convenience samples and f pick phenotypes that happen to be available, even if they're not the most interesting ones. As more and more people become genotyped. I th we, as Dan said, we think that the constraint is more and more going to be that the, que the, the sort of phenotypes that we're ultimately interested in the social science, sciences may not be measured in these data sets because often the primary purpose uh, behind, behind their collection is, is uh, to study medical um, question. And so, you know, yes, we're very interested in how new technologies can be used to sort of help, um, to help gather richer phenotypic data. Um, okay, then there's this question of candidate uh, genotyping. Now, Mike Keller made a point about these, you know, custom arrays that people still sometimes use. Um, as far as I can tell, it's almost never a uh, good idea to get one of those custom arrays because you, the, the, uh, the, the, the standard SNP chips are basically going to capture all of that variation and, and a lot more. Um, so the real, the real, um, the real choice is between whether you want to do genomide genotyping, genomide, uh, g gather genomide data or sequencing data. And this is ultimately boils down to what, what, your, what your question is. Obviously, the, the genome-wide data is not going to do a good job capturing um, uh, rare variants, but the, but the advantage is that it's, um, that it's a lot um, cheaper. OK. So let me say something about the job market, um, um, because uh, this is a question that has a tendency to come up. Um, I, don't, I don't pretend to, 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 to have um, uh, you know, to know the answer here, th there's a lot of uncertainty naturally, and basically what I'm going to do is I sort of give you what I think is Dan's and my take on, on job market prospects for people 
who work in this field. Okay, so I'll do, we'll do it by field again, okay? And um, my experience, having done this with economics, is that, well, there are plenty of people. This list is from last year, and I think it's since expanded, so, so let's just start by saying that <coughs> there's a precedent of people who work with genetic data getting jobs in economics departments. Um, and in our experience, there's very little ideological opposition um, to genetics research in economics. The criticism tend to fall along the you know, tend to tend to be have the flavor of, of uh, you know, why is this why do I need genetic data uh, given my research interest and that's a very good criticism that's a very good question and it's definitely one you'll need to have a convincing answer to if you want to get a uh, job uh, in a you know working as a social scientist it has to be the case that ultimately your goal is to use genetic data to provide a more credible answer to some question that we that we uh, that we that we try to that we study in the, in the social sciences. Um, now, it is the case, not just in economics, but in all, all of the social sciences, that most departments who are trying to hire are f first and foremost going to be interested in you know, making sure that they're going to be able to satisfy their teaching obligations. And that means that if you're one of these uh, exotic people who works on strange things, it helps a lot if you can make a compelling case that you can teach, uh, you know, uh, that you can have some methodological skills and can teach can teach econometrics or labor or something like that, something that's considered more, um, more mainstream. Um, and you know, in, in, in some cases, it might be a, actually a disadvantage that, that it's not exactly clear what kind of field um, um, you belong to. OK, so then what we did, we don't know a ton about these other disciplines. So what we did was just email people. Um, and so we're going to defer to their expertise. And we're going to do it with, you know, we're going to do psychology. We're going to say something about sociology. And we're going to say to something about politics. So I'll defer to the expert here. We'll start with psychology. And here's James's take from last year. We're, we're um, reproducing his quote here again um, with his permission. And this is what he, what, what he had to say. OK, so there are a couple there are the usual suspects for BG. <laughs> and in recent years, there's been an infiltration of other places. Um, and then he provides some names of behavior geneticists who have been you know, hired in various um, US departments. Um, I don't know what else to say about psychology, except that, yeah. Oh, um, I'm not sure if this is part of the clinical site, actually. Sure. 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 Yep. Do you think, does James want to add something? Um, no, I mean, that's not the case. Not today, still. Well, I, I will add something. Sure. And of course, historically, BG was a branch of psychology. At least that's the way I thought about it. So maybe, maybe psychology is the one social science where the integration has come the furthest in, in, in some ways. OK. Well, I'll make one comment. Yeah. Um, so uh, a Colorado Boulder, uh, behavioral genetics to me is more of an autonomous discipline. Yeah. There's an own institute. Yep. Also, it's actually multiple disciplinary with people from different departments. And that's true. Also, 
also in clinical biological psychopathology and a lot of the people there are actually just behavioral geneticists, which is Bob Kruger. Um, so, um, yeah. All right, good. So next, we, we also got Dalton's permission to reproduce his quote from last year. I'll just, I'm just going to let you read it. Uh, the, I think the, the bottom line is that uh, you know, he thinks that this is an area where, the, where there's more sort of, um, uh, uh, where, where, where there is a fair amount of ideological resistance still in place, um, but he seems to be pretty bullish about the sort of the, the long run prospects of the field. And of course, there are many, many ways in which genetic data, I, ho I, I hope we've managed to convey this message uh, during these two weeks, many ways in which it's plausible that genetic data could be really useful for understanding the questions that sociologists study. Can I, there's a, it's a two part quote, so I'll let you, I'll let you finish. Oh, okay. Yeah, and he does make the, you know, in, his, in his view, I mean, obviously, with these things, you're just getting our personal takes. You should seek out other people's opinions. You might not get exactly the same message. Um, but his view is that, especially at the top departments, they are becoming increasingly welcoming of this sort of um, um, analysis, okay? And he goes on. <laughs> yeah. Sam finished already. Did everyone else finish reading? Okay. Oh. They're not as fast as you. And I, I do want to just endorse two of the points he's making here. The first is that if you're not passionate about the subject matter, you're not going to write a great paper anyway. So, so that's a factor to consider. The second is that if, if it's at all possible, and if you are worried about the risks, because it's always going to be riskier in a small field, um, um, the, um, it, you know, th there's certainly some value to having conventional work on the side that, that, that allows you to you know, convince convince the median fu potential future colleague in a sociology or economics department that you also, you're also able to write uh, sort of papers that they consider uh, you know, in, the main in the mainstream. Okay, um, I, I should say also that sociology seems pr is probably the one branch of social science where we have the largest number of academics devoted to this, to this sort of work. In fact, when we had this workshop last year, um, I think sociology was the discipline with the largest number of students represented this year with a slight Slight, um, um, slightly fewer, uh, uh, slightly larger number of economists, but it was, you know, a pretty close call. Um, politics is certainly the smallest. Here's what Chris wrote to us last year. Again, we're, we're, we're reproducing it with his permission. Um, I, I, I'd say that political science sort of remains the, the field with the with the fewest number of people who are actively working on this area. Of course, there's no reason why that couldn't change in, in, in the years ahead. And of course, there's a branch of political science called political psychology that, that you know, where they study questions um, that overlap substantially with, with, with behavior genetics. And my sense has been that it's, you know, it's, 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 it's in political psychology especially that, that there's been the greatest interest. Question? I'm just curious, um, what about anthropology? Um, oh. <laughs> Yeah, don't anthropologists don't they don't the social and the biological anthropologists spend most of their time fighting each other? I, um, yeah, I I I I I don't know a ton about that world to be honest. Yeah, I, you, you want to say something about anthropology? Yeah. Okay, go. Sorry. <laughs> cultural, not social. Oh, cultural. Sorry, I stand corrected. Yeah, yeah. My sense is that they tend to know, like for the sort of work they do with genetic data t tends to have, you know, tends to overlap less with the sort of statistical social science issues we've been talking about, and more with other things like you know, evolution, population genetics, these sorts of things. And maybe maybe that's why um, 
that's maybe why, why we've interacted with them, with them less. Uh, but it's certainly true that in any anthropology department with, with biological anthropologists, you're going to find, um, you're going to find people with um, sort of broadly interested in what we do. Yeah. Sure. Yep. Yep. No, that, that, that's, that's certainly true. And of course, we have not talked about, we've purposefully sort of left out, um, we've purposefully left out other more branches, of, you know, branches like epidemiology or health policy. And of course, um, <laughs> given, the, given, given the increasing availability of these data, the, the demand for Skill, people who have had developed the skills to analyze these large data sets is only going to increase and obviously in departments and schools like that, that I think there are going to be enormous opportunities in the, in the years ahead. Um, okay, so what are some common themes of this com these comments? Um, well, it's a new field, so, so that, that poses certain risks that you, wouldn't, that you wouldn't face if you were just doing conventional labor economics or something like that. Um, it's a thin market. Um, it, there's a, a tremendous amount of uncertainty about how things will develop. Um, I think less so than five years ago, for sure. I mean, when we, f when we started the A2, I was pretty sure that we would find nothing at genome-wide significance. Dan wasn't, and he was, he was right. A1, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, 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 um, and um, I don't think very many, you know, I don't think it was obvious to very many people at the time that, you know, that going from, going from 10,000 to a million subjects would make such a huge difference in terms of our ability to finally detect reliable associations. At least, at least back then, it seemed to me that it wasn't at all clear if that magical number would be roughly a million or maybe 10 million, um, and to what extent these effects would be so different across environments so as to swamp a lot of the, you know, our ability to detect, you know, construct predictable, uh, predictive PGSs. Uh, but now a lot of that uncertainty has been resolved, and, uh, um, and so there's every reason, you know, there are good reasons to be optimistic. But that, but by that, I don't mean to imply um, that there isn't a lot of uncertainty about where <coughs> things eventually um, turn up, uh, turn out. Okay, now there are risks, of course, of being the first mover in the field, but there are also advantages, which is that you know you're one of the people who was who was there early, and that's going to you know give you a head start. Um, and and you know our 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 view is that in, in expectation at least the amount of the number of people, the, the most likely scenarios are the number of people who enter this field is only going to grow, uh, continue to grow. Um, and, and that means that if you were one of the people who's there early, that, that's, that's going to create a lot of opportunities for you. Okay, uh, you're in a unique position to be there. Okay, let me say something very quickly. Um, so I'm gonna do like a formal uh, thank you on camera so that the people, um, you know, I want, I, want, I want the people who are following on us on YouTube to know, um, um, uh, that we're grateful to a number of people for helping to put this together. And then w once we're done, we'll also do like an off-camera um, uh, postscript, okay? So here are the thank yous. The first thing is we're obviously very grateful to the instructors. Um, I hope we, hope we listed all of them. Um, they all took time out of their busy schedules to come here. Um, and they get very little in return, except for the opportunity to meet all of you. And, and, and that's frankly what uh, I think motivates them for the most part. Um, so yeah, I, ho I hope you'll sort of join me in thanking them. And if you do, I hope you stay in touch with some of them. And I hope you, at some point, that you, like when if the opportunity presents itself, that you'll um, uh, that you'll tell them personally how that you, you know how grateful you are for their time. You know, I want to thank Robbie and Megan. Megan left us already, but but um, uh, I haven't you know I haven't been to all of the TA sessions. But as far as I can tell, they've done a phenomenal job. They also spent a lot of time preparing um, for. Um, um, preparing problem sets and you know making this a good learning experience for you. So you know maybe we can maybe we can give Ro Robbie a, a hand. <laughs> okay, so let's hold applause for Samantha. We'll deal with her in a second. Let me just say <laughs> let me just say for the record that that uh, she's been doing a ton of work behind the scenes. Um, we want to thank the staff here at the um, at the hotel. Um, for, for helping us with a number of things. Um, we want to thank uh, Leon, uh, Liana at Russell Sage, who's been sort of our uh, person, our uh, contact person there throughout this process, throughout the planning process. As, as always, she's been incredibly responsive and helpful. We want to thank the Russell Sage Foundation. Uh, without them, we wouldn't have, um, um, you know, the, the, for providing the funds that allowed, you, allowed us to do this. Um, and then there's one more, um, 
one more bullet on my list, which is all of you guys. Um, um, we're really, we're, we're, we're impressed by all of you. In fact, I've been on graduate admissions at NYU a couple of times, and I always go through, if we get a thousand applications, I go through all of them, and it makes me wonder how on earth I ever got into graduate school. And, <laughs> and uh, reading your applications, we felt the same way. So, you know, we're, we're very lucky that you all, that you all took t two weeks out of your life to come here. Uh, we hope it was a good experience for you. Um, and thank you so much for investing, um, you know, a lot of time into learning the material and, be, and, and you know, asking good questions and keeping us honest. Um, so I, you know, with that, um, thank you all. <laughs>